hoping to link in maybe with you all about this idea of that there should be, I think, some movement to stop the use of the word crazy or associated words as terms of abuse. I think it's a really terrible mm. thing in this world that actually crazy is a term of abuse. Well, it's, um, it's better than being called a witch, like I was saying. Well, yeah, well, but I mean, you see, what, what I don't like is... Well, I'll try and keep things very brief, but I was misdiagnosed, and there's an, an awful lot of issues about to come out over the issue of misdiagnosis of mental illness. The, the D5 diagnostic book is about to come out, which is about to cause a whole lot of trouble, because it's making very clear that the, the previous D books have been quite mistaken in how they've gone about making Okay, let me diagnosis. just say, those are the books where, you know, a doctor looks it up and says, you have depression, you have ADHD. Yeah. So yeah. those are the books that are called the D, D something. series. Yeah. yeah. The diagnostic. And there's always, like, they're on yeah. episode five now. They're, well, no, they're on episode four, but they're about to put out episode five. Right. And apparently there's going to be chaos when this thing comes out because it's saying exactly what happened to me. In particular, that what's, what's happened with an awful people is that people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which I do, are being misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder, and that's what So they said you case. had bipolar? Well, this is how my diagnosis was made, and this is Ireland, and welcome to Ireland, and welcome to Sinead O'Connor's world. Well, how my diagnosis was made was highly very dodgy, right, where, where I, uh, I had a baby. I had an affair with a married man, we sometimes do, and I had a baby, which I'm very happy about. At the time, the father didn't want to be involved with the child. He is now, thank God, and he's a lovely, lovely man. Um, but at the time, he was adamant he wasn't going to be involved with the child, and I became very depressed about this. Um, I also, at the time, I wasn't working, so I had been looking after the kids for a few years. I, at that stage, three kids. I had no nanny or cleaner. Or That's enough to drive you nuts. And... Um, I just became, after the child was about five months old, I was depressed, postnatally, really, and yeah. I was exhausted and tired, and I was very, really, really terribly distressed that this man wasn't going to be in the child's life. And I felt somehow this was my fault, you know, because I had been angry at him and all these kind of things, you know. And so I just got terribly, terribly depressed, really, and, and, and in a way that I had never been depressed before. And I had, had issues with depression because I... Um, uh, came from a very bad childhood, uh, uh, came from an extremely barbaric child abuse situation. So that's why I suffer from post-traumatic st stress disorder, twitch, twitch. But I, um, Always? Uh, uh, Since you were a kid? Yes, yeah, yeah. But, um, in, so what, in what way? Like if you hear something, usually certain have things, a... certain smells, maybe things, just just certain things can push That buttons. remind you? It wouldn't even necessarily remind you, but that you'd, you'd just be quite wounded and sore in certain areas and quite vulnerable in certain areas. Right. And yeah, certain types of people you might attract that you shouldn't. And yeah. the low self-esteem thing, um, the whole, right. you know, yeah, you know, just, you know, it, it can create uh, kind of emotional. I suppose I would be somebody who over the years would have had emotional problems, not mental problems but that is emotional know, you know well you know what I mean? same yeah. yeah yeah but it wasn't a chemical thing if you understand what i mean or if it was it was yeah. because it came so what's from, the difference you know? between post traumatic stress order and then you're flipping into to me it's the same thing well it well but it is except for that there's no need for someone who isn't suffering from bipolar disorder to be taking really heavy antipsychotic medication so, so somebody you know? said you had so this is what happened to me is i went to the doctor after i got i got depressed there after the child and this that and the other i went to the doctor i go to the doctor in ireland and it's because it's me and i say look i'm feeling suicidal I said that's not me I said I, I never feel like that I don't you know I know there's something wrong and it was actually kind of funny I laugh about it now but you know when you're feeling kind of depressed like I was, I was looking at trees and instead of a beautiful tree I see something I could hang myself on <laughs> you know what I mean everything in the world became, no, I know. could I you, you can know? only laugh with Which another person quite funny, actually, yeah. you know? so I said this cars to the take out a whole new meaning yeah like, can exactly. I get under that body? Yeah. So I said this to the doctor. I said, trees have stopped looking pretty. Like, do you know what I mean? They look like something I can hang myself on. I said, this isn't me. It's not normal. I'm actually quite a funny, silly, happy person. Do you know what I mean? Um, so in front of me, he rings the local nuthouse. Forgive me for calling it the nuthouse, but we can all share the joke. Um, and in front of me, he says, I've got Sinead O'Connor in my office. Now, remember, this is in Ireland where I'm a controversial kind of female because yeah. I'm not behaving apparently like a, an Irish female is supposed to behave. So I'm kind of threatening over the years. Not meaning to be, but, you know, I'd be a controversial kind of character just because I'm not in the roles that Irish women are supposed to be in. I would say no. So, you know. So your man rings a note house of Sinead O'Connor in my office. She says she's suicidal. What do you think? They chat away from it. He puts the phone down in front of me. He goes, the guy at the nut house said, well, from what I read about her in the papers, I'd say she has bipolar disorder. Over the telephone? Yeah. 
so that's how it, the diagnosis, and then which they was never an actual diagnosis, was made. That was it? They gave me the drugs. I said, great. I said, I, half of me was appalled that they did such a thing. The other half was just, I need to go home and look after my kids. I couldn't wash the dishes. The way I felt at the time, it was the way I described it to the doctor, it's like a, I ran to a friend's house with my baby. I couldn't go home. I got another friend to stay with my other kids. I said, the way it feels to me, if I open my front door, there's no floor. It's the best way I could describe it. That's I open the door, I go in, there's no floor. I can't stand to wash the dishes. I literally cannot stand up. I can't go to the fridge. I can't do anything. So I was like, give me the drugs, play. I go home and look after my kids. Never thought about it, you know. Um, but half of me was like really quite wounded that it was made in such a dodgy way, you know. Yeah. But I was just so grateful that somebody said, right, take that and you'll be fine. Yeah. You know? So I took the drugs and everything for, for a few years. and then I, few, How many years? I actually took them for eight years. And then what happened was, after a few years, I began, it began to dawn on me that in Ireland, and we were talking about this the other night, in Ireland there's this terrible culture of, and perhaps it's worldwide, of, you know, we all seem to think the doctors are God. You never question the doctor. It's like the priest. You never question the priest. But, you know, well, the next step is doctors. So it's a bit like in Ireland. If the doctor says black is white, then black is white, you know. And they dole you out these drugs. They don't tell you the side effects of well, either what are know, going on them or coming off them. Yeah. They're very heavy meds, you know. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I was on the drugs for a good few years. And then I noticed that actually I was still having some of the problems that I was having before, which were emotional issues, you know, sadness. I would say more than depression. I was just very sad because of how I'd grown up, really. I hadn't healed. Now, I'd say I had now, but as I was younger, when I was growing into that point, I was just a sore-hearted person, you know. Um, sore-hearted person? Yeah. You know. It's such a great expression. Yeah, for good reason, though, yeah. you know. And even I say with anger, you know, I always say anger is like a fist of tears, isn't it? It's made out of tears, it's just a big bowl of tears, not cried, you know. So even when I was younger, I was angry, but it was really to cover tears. And the more when you're a little woman, isn't it, when you're a little female. Yeah, you get like little Hitler. You've got to act tough, like little dogs always act tougher than big dogs. Just, you know, yeah. I, I always say I couldn't afford to be a poppy in a tsunami. I had to be a football, do you understand <laughs> what I mean? But then I one day realised, actually, I am a poppy, I'm not a tsunami, I'm not a football, I need to get out of the fucking tsunami, you know. Anyway. So it began to dawn on me because other emotional issues were coming up that actually I don't think I have bipolar disorder because these drugs aren't stopping. Okay, they're stopping. The suicidal thing went away. But you're, I had only had a baby and I was exhausted and no one asked me, look, you know, I found in Ireland because I'm me, it was very easy to slip through the cracks that no one would just treat me like a regular person. I'd go to psychiatrists, yeah. they'd start talking to me about what was in the paper about me that day. They'd start lecturing me about, you know, you shouldn't talk about sex and you shouldn't talk about this and you shouldn't talk about that and this is bad for you. Can yourself. I ask, you couldn't, I was going to ask you this, but you couldn't mm. get on the airplane and just come here as an hour away? I'm, well, you know what, I'd love to. I mean, that's so years, bizarre for seven years. Well, I'm, I am now, yeah. You know, how dangerous, mm. but mm. you know it affects your liver. Oh yeah. So anyway, so it dawned on me drugs, after a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. But it dawned on me after a couple of years that I thought that the diagnosis was mistaken because I was still having some emotional issues, you know, um, just pain or whatever I had, you know, that I had to work through. And the, and how I then began to know that the doctors did not in Ireland anyway know what they're talking about. And we have to be really careful here because obviously nobody should ever come off their meds without proper medical supervision. Do you know what I mean? And we don't want to give yeah. the impression that people who really do need their meds. You know, Should don't, ever don't come be irresponsible, yeah. like, do you know what I mean? But do do ask questions, though, you know. But um, So I go, what happened then in the end was my eldest child, who's 24, left home. This was three years ago. And, jeez, you'd think someone died. What happened to me? Up came all this grief, do you know. And I couldn't stop crying for a year. I was, my hair was falling out. I was losing weight. I couldn't sleep. Couldn't you would think someone died. You'd think the child died on me, like, you know. And um, I got the sense that all of this grief that's coming up, I felt it's not all about the child leaving home, actually. A lot of it was. But I felt a lot of it was actually all old grief, you know, childhood stuff, you know what I mean, abandonment, all this shit, you know, yeah, yeah. death, all kind of, all just grief, you know. And it was a great gift in a way that it came up by the child leaving home. But what happened was I was going to the stupid psychiatrist and I was saying to him, I feel I need some therapy. <laughs> Uh, because I felt, what I felt, I said was, I feel like there's a pool of tears sitting just right there. It's just ready to cry. I just need to go maybe six times and have a good cry and then I'll be fine. I can move on. The, um, the guy was forbidding me to go to therapy. Now I'm explaining to him, look, I came from a barbaric, violent upbringing, a, a horrific upbringing that would take 200 years to explain. I'm explaining this to the guy, he's insisting on... A doctor. Me. A psychiatrist. Ireland, you know, actually an English guy, believe it or not, but... Mm. He's like, uh, oh no, I forbid you to go for therapy. You're not to look at your childhood. You're to forget about your childhood. You're just to move on, forget about it. You know, take lithium, take this, take that, that, the other. And I used to, I took lithium when I was first diagnosed. I had to stop because I couldn't sing. I had no feelings. So I'm like, <laughs> I need my feelings if I'm going to sing. 
you know, and, do music. You know, and then what happened is I kept going back every every week or so, and you see, you think they're God, and you think then when you feel anything painful, you're like you're running to the psychiatrist, and it's actually no, stop, stop, it's just life, it's just life. You know, you just need a hug or a cup of tea or somebody to ask you, are you okay? You know the way you go in a cafe sometimes and you feel a bit sad. The strange lady will ask you, are you all right? You want to cry? Do you know where she put a bit of milk in your tea and you nearly cry? All you need is a bit of tenderness. Uh, you don't need drugs. There, you know, so. I mean, I can't. You, you have friends. Can't they Sorry. pull it out of you? Well, in Ireland it's very difficult for me because of me being me. It's really hard in Ireland. Outside of Ireland, nobody really knows who I am or gives a shit. But in Ireland, it's very difficult for me because I'm so well known there that it's quite hard for me to have a regular life. Guy says life. you don't need a therapist. So anyway, and this is what happened. I keep going to this guy every time I'm freaking out. So my son leaves home. I'm in bits, and it keeps getting worse. I'm going to this guy. He's forbidding me to therapy. And then what begins to happen is something that never happened to me before. I began to get panic attacks. So it began with I began to just feel a bit frightened. So there's all this grief which I'm trying to get out, your man's trying to block it in. I'm thinking, no, nah, this is wrong. And then I began to feel fear. So I go to him and say, I'm feeling a bit frightened. I don't know what's going on. I really think I need to go for some therapy. I think I just need to cry. You know, I'm fine. It's like, not oh, asking a lot. No. Yeah. And then um, I keep going, I keep going. The fear gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it turns into panic attacks. I'm having 24-hour panic attacks, literally. I've never had anything like it in my life. You know, I literally will go, we'll go up in the morning, feel fine. Within five minutes up, my body would just kind of terror. I couldn't move. I'd like that for the day terrified like you know it's stupid like and then I go back to your man he's like no no take more lithium and I'm like no no and that's when I knew it dawned on me I don't have bipolar disorder at all I said to myself so what I did then is I checked myself into a nut house in Ireland sorry for calling it nut house it's the only thing to call it like it's funny it's funny I mean the fucking world is a nut house no, certainly the music business is but um so I got them to do an assessment. I stayed there for two weeks and I got them to assess me. And I then did the same again a year later. And both of those assessments said there's absolutely no evidence of bipolar disorder. Now, when I went for the original diagnosis, I had now, was never asked by that GP any symptoms. No one asked me a symptom. I never had a high. I never dressed up as Tutankham and I went into town as I have a friend who does. You know, I never had the sexual manics or the crazies or the highs or the up for days or I only ever had the suicide. And you stayed on you it know, for eight years? Eight freaking years. You know, you don't seem like a, a sucker yeah. to me, but I can't believe that mm. somebody could keep you down for eight years. Well, they did because we're brought up to believe the doctors are God. And I was happy to think... You know, I used to, because I came from child abuse too, and a lot of your people that you'll be talking to and hearing mental health issues can come from child abuse. It does. And it can yeah. happen to you because of this. It's not necessarily genetic. Well, it makes you vulnerable yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah, and my thing was that I, I um, what's the way to put it? When you're that wounded from child abuse, it's such a terribly painful set of wounds you're carrying. If somebody says to you, take that and you're going to be fine, you'll it. just freaking take it when you're young and you don't know any better. Do you know what I mean? And also, I come from Ireland, where it's a country we've been bred to believe the doctors and the priests are God, and we do not. What happens here them. now? Like you, so, we're sitting in England mm. now. Do you go to somebody? Well, now, that now, well, right? now, what happened is um, fantastically here. Well, uh, I then went for a, a, yet another assessment just to be double, double sure. So there's basically no, no, there's no evidence of bipolar disorder. I was never asked any symptoms by these the, the people who made the diagnosis. You know, it was purely made on the fact that I'm Sinead O'Connor. I'm not behaving myself. What they read in the paper. Me, you know what I mean? um, Are so, we in a backwater here somewhere in Ireland, or is this a big city? Ireland is. No, no, very, I know what no, Ireland it's is. Dublin, but the whole country. And, uh, as I said, when I wrote you, look, we, we, you know, it's a very backward country. And I say that about me. Look, I'm a 21st century woman. I live in a 15th century country. Right. And certainly, medically speaking, it's, it's dire. And certainly, when it comes to psychiatric health, it's dire. But there is too much of this thing of, um, you know, I think loneliness is what causes a lot of trouble for people. People are lonely as all, you know. And a lot of people go to the doctor feeling sad. The doctor gives them drugs and sends them home. And actually, it'd be better to give, introduce them to a group or a social life. That's what or, we're trying to do. Or whatever, so you know, that kind of way. Well, that's so, why, I mean, um, why didn't you meet anybody else and say, you have bipolar, here's my symptoms? Well, no, do you know what? All I ever met was people who said to me they didn't think at all that I had bipolar. None of my family know what knew me, no other doctors who actually knew me felt it, you know. Right. So then well, I just decided to take the thing into my own hands. Now I was responsible because I knew I shouldn't be irresponsible because it's selfish not to take your meds if you are ill. God, you're you know? a good girl. Do you know what I mean? Considering you've got to you're consider a rebel, everyone you're around being you. a little too good. Well, you've got to consider everyone around you as well, do you yeah. know what I mean? And you want to be well, do you know what I mean? And I was always someone who was very diligent about recovery from my childhood and this, that, or the other. And I was lucky I had the money to go to therapy. Quite frankly, the poor people have no bloody money. But you know? they wouldn't give Which you a therapist. Which is another issue, you know. I, I believe our birthright is joy. 
that you know, believe that's our natural birthright. So if we're not joyous, there's something on us that we need to fight. For eight years, know? that's what I can't So eight years, and what they don't tell you, the side effects going on the drugs, and when I came off the drug, then the other thing that happened was I began to get pressure on me about being overweight from the drugs. Horribly in this world, there's all this pressure on all women, and especially those of us who do what we do for a living, to be, we're supposed to be skinny, which is bollocks, but there you go. No, that's one of the so, great gifts of uh, bipolar drugs, you know, that you have a look of pregnancy. Yeah. Then I go to the doctor, this psychiatrist, who's a horrible bitch that I was going to, starts lecturing me about, she's, she's real churchical and she doesn't like what I stand for, that I've been fighting the church and she's lecturing me about writing about sex and starting the other. But then I say to her one day, look, I'm, I'm sad because everyone's giving out to me about being fat. She says, oh, we'll take you off the drugs then. I'm like, well, why have I been on these drugs? Do you know, what, what? So she took me off them and I left her because she at the same time was giving me a series of bollockings about um, fighting the church, which I thought was terribly irresponsible for her. And I left and... and uh, this I, is still I, Ireland. Yeah. What, what's happened but, since you're here? Well, I don't live here in England. I live, you're sadly, going back sadly I live in fucking Ireland, yeah, but one day I'll come back here. I did live here for 20 years. But, do you think it's that different um, here? I mean, I know I that do, everybody well, that, that's what I was going to get crazy. to. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's what I'm going to get to now, is that, that then what, what I realise is I'm, I'm screwed in Ireland. I can't be seen as a regular person by a doctor because they're seeing Sinead O'Connor and all the projections and preconceived ideas they have about that, so I can't just get a straight set of answers. You, you know? could at least say I'm not bipolar. Um, you can give me everything Well, else. I got, I came finally off the drugs slowly with your one's permission, but again, she didn't tell me the side effects. Now, this doctor that I was going to was sued successfully by a woman who was pregnant, was given meds by this doctor, was not told the side effects, and the child was born with some very severe physical problems, and, and you know, the doctor was sued for half a million quid. This woman wasn't told the side effects. I wasn't told any side effects, nor was I told the side effects of coming off the drugs. So I came off the drugs very slowly, but I was then left to my own devices, basically. Now, what can happen is coming off these drugs is terribly difficult, and you can, in fact, sometimes develop some of the symptoms of the illness that you didn't have while you're coming off them. So you're like a shipwreck for six to nine months, like a maniac, basically, you know, just trying to get clean off the drugs. And now the only problem I have is that I'm happier than I ever was on the drugs. You know what I mean? I, like, even when I go through troubles in life or whatever, they're, they're normal troubles. You're off you know everything? I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You think that can stay? Because that's yes, the, the million-dollar question. Oh, for me, it can stay, yeah. Now, the only trouble I do have, and I wouldn't mind if anyone has any help about this, but I... I, I was on, and again, now the doctors are telling me the doses these fuckers had me on of drugs was, was a toxic doses on a 400 milligrams of lamictal and 200 That's milligrams of amitriptyline. That's the one that makes you sleepy. Amitriptyline is yeah. the one that makes me sleepy, 200 yeah. milligrams. 200 milligrams, these are toxic doses. Why, why was I on them? And they took me off them like that because I said I'm fat. And then they're telling me I don't have the, yeah. the illness in the first place. Well, why am I on them? So now what's left with me, the only thing is I can't sleep. My stupid body is dependent on these drugs for eight years to go to sleep, and I cannot go to sleep now unaided, which is really quite difficult. So, what do you think we can? What do you think can be done? I mean, well, now have, what I've yeah. done is I um, was directed here. It was actually an American. I love Americans. I really fucking love. Americans. Well, they're crazy too. Well, do you know what though? I, Americans are the kindest people on earth to me. I just think they're the kindest people you could meet as American people. And what happened was I actually met a gentleman at the American Embassy in London. I went uh, not long ago for my visa, and I ended up having a conversation with this man who runs the embassy in London. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, a young man, which is astonishing as well. Younger than me to think, Jesus man you're going to make has actually changed my life for the better I ended up having just a conversation with this man and he knew of me and a bit about me and he, uh, he knew that I had written uh, that I had there was a, a time where I wasn't sure if the diagnosis was bipolar or post-traumatic stress and that and just out of kindness the guy started talking to me about it and how was it and this that and the other and um, he gave me the number of a medical centre that they use when they want to know if somebody has like syphilis or the other going to America and said look would you like to go and get a proper I told him my, my situation in Ireland and, you know, what's the, the, the difficulty with being treated as a regular person by a doctor or whatever. So he sent me to these people and they recommended me to this fantastic guy that I've now gone to at the Priory. And um, really I'm only going there to learn to sleep, actually, yeah. or to find out if, you know, you know, I can do something about sleeping. As far as post-traumatic stress disorder goes, their attitude really is, like there's no drugs for that and there's no need to take drugs for it. You just need to learn who is okay to be around, who's not okay to be around, you know. What, you know, when you suffer from post-traumatic stress and or you come from abuse, you're the kind of person who you're so wide open sensitive and I'm probably being a singer as well as the same, but if I, for example, I, if I sit beside a drunk person, I feel drunk. 
I don't drink. But if you know, if I sit beside a very depressed person, I'll feel depressed. You know, if I lie beside a suicidal person, I'll feel suicidal, and I I won't realise it's not my feelings. You understand? Yeah, me? yeah, yeah. You um, pick up everybody's. Go yeah. to Disneyland. So well, well that'd be hell or earth. <laughs> that'd be worse. I'd probably get depressed. But so that was the, there. This guy's attitude kind of was look. The only way to deal with post-traumatic stress in your case, when it's not terribly, terribly severe, it's not like you hear a bang, you're under the table, do you know, or anything like that. But it's just be really careful who you hang out with. What kind? You know, be aware of the type of person you are, you're a sensitive person, you know, careful who you hang out with, careful Fitulous. how you talk to yourself, yeah. you know, and how do you treat yourself. And I did, by sheer luck, find a fantastic therapist now in Ireland that I've been going to for a year who's a really wonderful therapist by some miracle. Why is a therapist um, good? How, how do you define this guy is good. Wants to know. Well, what I found good, you see, what I think with therapy is that an awful lot of therapists are just general therapists. They don't have an area of expertise. They never tell you that, of course, because they want you to keep coming, you know. But, and I wasted a lot of time over the years with therapist that didn't have an area of expertise, but this guy is an actual proper child abuse therapist. He's, he's oh, designed true, yeah. for people like me, you know, so he hooks you up to brain machines, he can tell how much of your brain is in fight or flight and how much of it isn't. When you go, do you think you need to pick the scabs of your past in order to heal yourself? That's well, no, you see, that's the myth that people think about child abuse therapy, is that you don't actually spend really any time going back there. I mean, there's no, the therapist has no interest, and neither do I, in reliving, thanks very much, anything that went on. What they're really dealing with is now. Yeah. So it's, it's for example, someone like me, a child abuse survivor, would go there and go, you know, oh, I'm a really bad person because of this, and I'm bad because of that, and I'm bad because of this, and this means I'm bad, and this means I'm bad, and, you know, convincing everyone how bad you are. Well, they're just rewiring your thinking. Now, they don't bring you back and go, look, you think you're bad because your mother used to make you say, I am nothing over and over while she beat the crap out of you. Do you know what I mean? That You don't have to go back and relive that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But it's just about re reprogramming your thinking. So all this guy does is tell me what a wonderful, amazing person I am and how it's great to be me and how God made me exactly as I am. And I'm a one in a 400 million chance and, you know, I'm just absolutely perfect and glorious exactly as I am. You know, That's I, all they really so, should say. Yeah, so you should, you should never actually come out of a therapist feeling like shit. That's what a lot of people say, saying, better. I've been with somebody for two years mm. and I'm still, and I go, get out of there. Well, this guy changed my life and there's an awful lot of wankers and I've gone to a lot of them and all and, you know, it's a bit like every business, do you know what I mean? But, but this guy is just fantastic. So, like, if to, it, with, with therapy, I would recommend you define your issue and find an expert in that issue, do you know what I mean? But also make so sure there's me. a relationship because exactly, if you, you don't like on. the guy, he's reshaping your brain to think yeah. it's your fault that you don't like uh, him. Well, and also, for me, I find too that... Uh, if you're a person who's at all spiritualized, you're better with a therapist who is also. An awful lot of ther uh, interesting thing about therapy is the Freudians, for example, when they translated Freud's work, every time he used the word soul, they changed it to mind. Right, they took out the spirituality, you know. And I found I could never quite progress with a therapist who didn't have any well, spirituality. We're, we're, we're over Freud anyway. So, yeah. You know, God bless him for the but, um, but what I was going to say now, what I, I, the eight years that I had, you know, living as a person who, as it turns out, mistakenly, you know, but a person who believed and who other people believed had a mental illness was a very interesting experience. And I really feel very strongly out of it about this thing about, you know, we should cease this thing of using crazy as a term of abuse. Because what I found was, and I know a lot of people, millions of people find this, if people think you have a mental illness, they think it, they take it as a license to dismiss everything you think, do, say or feel. Because? Why do you because think? Because you're mental. Yeah, but you know? why? What's so scary it's about being... It's just culture. It's yeah. our culture. It's just the way we've been Do you think that ever there'll be a time yeah. when somebody will say, actually, you know, the most important... Well, I, I think we need to start this, and I think I think what, what you're doing with Black Dog, I think, is terribly, terribly important. Really very, very, very important. And I think a campaign does need to start where it actually becomes illegal to use mm -hmm. these words as terms of abuse in the same way that you cannot sexually discriminate and say, and say words that are insulting to someone's... Uh, well, or, before or you get race. to the words, you know, the fact that it's on your CV, if, mm. if it says, yeah. you know, illnesses, you go cancer, whatever, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Even, you know, you, yeah. it shouldn't okay be held against a person that they have an illness. Job. Yeah. yeah, no, it should never be held against a person that that's they have That's where we are. And, and, I mean, Ireland is a terrible country. I mean, I, um, when I put I myself... I wouldn't say that and you're going back in a few Oh, days. I couldn't give a shit. Listen, English, come back. We fucking want you. Really. <laughs> We're sorry you left. I'm sorry you left. I am. We'd be better off. I am. It's true as God. I have no shame about it. I don't care. But, um... The way I see it, look, Ireland, I think, is, is probably similar to certain African countries, like where there's just a terrible, there's a stigma all over the world about mental illness, but in certain countries it's just a real, you're a pariah if you have a mental illness, yeah. you know. 
and people love to take the piss out of you. And in Ireland, for example, when I went in for my assessment, when I put myself into hospital to establish if I had the illness or not, there was a poor woman, God help her there, um, only about 35. She sliced her arms in pieces, you know, deep gashes all down her arm. What happened was the poor girl, she lived down the country in Ireland, her mother died of pancreatic cancer and the night her mother died this poor woman just freaked out and sliced herself to bits and all but she was from down the country and she was stuck up in the hospital in Dublin but she couldn't go back home because everyone knew what she had done and she couldn't return to the town that she lived in or take her job back around because they were all like we don't want anything to do with this crazy bitch do you know Pure that it was her grief was all early. She lost her mother. She, and Ireland doesn't. Such fit. a passionate we country. You, know, you think they so understand? Much. Exactly. But also in the world too, they teach all bullshit at school. All the shit that you don't need. They teach you nothing about living. Do you know what I mean? How to handle feelings. How to have relationships. Do you know what I mean? So what? This poor girl. It's not her fault. She didn't know how to handle her mother dying. She didn't know any better. Do you know? And as I wrote to you. Um, I uh, uh, had a letter from a man recently in Ireland, and this is typical, um, a 68-year-old man who wouldn't even identify himself wrote to me saying that he takes antidepressants, he's been taking them for years, his children are in their 30s, and he, his children and his wife do not know that he takes the antidepressants because he's of the stigma. He's afraid to even tell his own family, do you know what I mean? And that's the way it is in Ireland. So if people think you have a mental illness, they'll use it as something to hurt you with. So that then you have a, we have a terrible suicide problem in Ireland, particularly Everywhere. among young people. But it's partly coming from this culture that people don't feel safe to go and tell anyone they're feeling suicidal because yeah. it'll be used against you. It won't be used to help you. And now I think that's really awful, partly because, look, I was raised by my grandmother to believe that, look, you don't mock the afflicted. You know, you don't stare at people who are different, and you do not mock people for their afflictions. So to me, it makes no sense at all. I'm someone who I've spent 25 years in the music business being called crazy as a term of abuse. I'm treated like shit because I'm perceived as crazy. You know? And I'm thinking to myself, if these guys really believe I'm crazy, why are they being horrible to me about it? Do you know, why wouldn't you be nice? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, there, I think yeah. something you needs to happen. You would help a disabled person yeah. over a puddle. It's like, you know, so I think something needs to happen in the whole world, yeah. really, about, you know, look, hold on here a second, it's actually not okay to use crazy as a term of abuse or to use a person's mental illness against them as a way of dismissing their validity of what they think, do, say, and feel. Do you know what I mean? And then it's about defining what the hell is crazy. Anyway, do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I agree with you. The word depressed is actually only used in the yeah. English language when somebody has what we call depression in India yeah. it's a physical word yeah. it describes because they mm. don't understand mental and physical yeah. are, are the same it's thing spiritual and emotional, you know your yeah. hair gets depressed yeah. when you have an illness doesn't yeah. it yes. your oh, body yeah. your skin is yeah. different but yeah. depressed means yeah. oh I'm sad yeah. because you know I yeah. lost my I lost my yeah. you know, Whatever. But, but, but see, I think too, look, we're in a, we're in a, a whole lot of crime. I mean, we could talk for a hundred years yeah. here, obviously, look, but there is a certain aspect of all of this that I think the, the spirituality actually comes into it, because you've got, you've got, look, I think God didn't make more than one of us for nothing, right? Well, we're put on this earth to love each other and care about each other and keep each other company. I think it's a mistake we live in houses, quite frankly, do you know what I mean? We're lonely, everyone's lonely, which makes no sense at all. So then, you know, you've got uh, spiritual problems which are caused, and for example, you know, I don't know, say that girl that was in the hospital, her mother died and she chopped up her arms. Now, I mean, she, she has a spiritual problem. It's not particularly a mental problem or a mental illness, do you know what I mean? She needs some help and some love and but some everybody caring, does. You know what I mean? Exactly, but yeah. there's, a, there's an aspect, I'm not talking about religion or God or any of these things, but I think it's a mistake that we live in this world where there's sometimes just no reference to our spiritual condition. And is there any way in which we can heal our emotions through really engaging ourselves spiritually and, and healing well, our spirit? Well, if you think you know? saying mental is embarrassing, Spiritual is really awesome. Well, isn't that hilarious it's to me? Really I think it's hilarious that the, the way the proof that religion has failed is that people think you're mad if you believe in God. And I think that's <laughs> hilarious. You know what I mean? It's hilarious. But I do, I think, like, say, in America, for example, someone asked me recently, I was doing an interview for a gay magazine, they were saying the kids there are bullying each other, you know, kids are killing themselves because the young kids are coming out and their friends are bullying them. And I was thinking to myself, it's a mistake that they have no, you know, they took God out of the schools altogether, but they should have just a spiritual time or something because there's no conscience, there's no moral conscience, there's no one thinking, well, I better not steal that chocolate well, bar. Well, or emotional someone. intelligence, let's but just that, Yeah, that. but that, that, yeah. that translates into this psychiatric world and this world of mental illness. Is it really mental illness or are you upset or are you a bit spiritual?
spiritually upset? Do you need a snuggle? Do you know what I mean? Or yes, you might have a proper mental illness. Do you know, but there's an awful lot of us actually who we don't have a mental illness. We've been labelled and misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. But in fact, you know, it's possibly because there are all these other arenas that are not open yet. You know, no, that, that could help people. And know. there'll be a time when they'll crack your skull open. They'll be able to say neuron five million forty-seven is actually out of whack. And yeah. if somebody um, discriminates against you, then yeah, you know, it's like holding up a broken yeah. uh, pipe. You go, yeah. wait a minute, something was yeah. wrong. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, it's it's, just, it's terrible that it shouldn't be on your CV. It shouldn't be held against you. you so when I do travel. the march, you will you know, be in the oh, march. Oh, I will absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I thought we could borrow the clothes from the gay parade because they've put it away. Yeah, let's so not wear we any. Get some of their rainbows. Yeah, we exactly. Get exactly. And some exactly. But I do. I really do believe it, it would be good to start this movement about banning the use of these words as terms of abuse because I, I, it doesn't help. And then you've got to think of your younger people. Do you know what I mean? You do have your young teenagers and this, that, and the other trying to deal with crap. I think the for, with for me, and, it's, it's the first thing is saying this thing really exists. Then we'll yeah. worry about the, the you know the linguistics. Yeah, it's which say, thing exists? That, that seriously, mental illness isn't just you know because uh, it's I'm, not you your know, imagining. Yeah, yeah. I'm think it's actually like having a, you know we had a woman in the audience who had cancer. Right. and depression and we said which one's worse and she said the depression because with my cancer everybody can see I'm ill yes, yeah, so absolutely. you know let's yeah. live in a world yeah. where we got oh, yeah. this right because oh, yeah. the agony of yeah. depression is yeah. just as agonizing yeah. as having oh, yeah. a leg removed yeah and all, but also like I say I found that um, and I'm sure an awful lot of people have found this that if I for example uh, often you know I define myself in a situation because of what I do for a living where I'm with someone who's actually really disrespecting me and I would calmly say actually this is not acceptable the way you're speaking to and you know this isn't acceptable at all and then they go oh you're just being mental why don't you go to your psychiatrist you're just in a mood you know that way and that was the, no, that's I my, don't. but I think that's the experience of quite a lot of people that if people think you have a mental illness or if you do they use it as something actually to hurt you with do you know what I mean and they can disrespect you and when you stand up for yourself even gently they'll just disrespect you and go oh you're just mental do you know that kind of way so it's like, but you're like the girl in the know. playground who's been tortured by it, you know? It's yeah. like somebody got you with a I brand. Found, I did find, and now, I don't now think it's I Irish. No. There's something yeah. about you that makes people want to go like this, and I don't know what it is. Well, it's partly it is Ireland, definitely, but um, partly it is. And then you're too I sassy for this world. Possibly, I don't know. Well, no, I think I think it's turning around now. Outside yeah. of Ireland, I get treated very respectfully, yeah. and even when people critique things. They actually do it in a way it's not abusive. Yeah. I don't mind when, I, when I'm would, in England. Would you just leave? You can bring all your kids. I can't because the fathers of kids, you know, they need to see their dads. Well, you put them on an airplane. There. It's only how many know, dads are we talking? Just, you can just, get them on, you can do a package know, deal on a plane. I'd love to. I'd love to. But I, like my daughter's 16, all her friends are there. You know, that kind of I'm going to get myself a room here, I think. Yeah. I'm just gonna but what I find outside of Ireland is fantastic. Like even in England, like okay, they'll write, you know, yeah, she's crazy, just that, you know, but they say the same stuff, but in a way it doesn't hurt. I can go, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. And then they go, yeah, but who cares? Her record is great. Do you know what I mean? So that's kind of somebody in the audience the other night at the gig went, who cares? She's fucking crazy. She's a genius. You know, that's so I like that. You should yeah. get a T-shirt. Yeah, exactly. I'm crazy, but I'm also a genius. Exactly. That's yeah, not yeah. a bad um, piece yeah. of marketing. Well, some psychiatrist years ago said to me, you know, sanity is only insanity put to good use. You know. Which I think makes a lot of sense. You know. Was he Irish? Uh, no, he was American. Well, yeah, in the wrong place at yeah. the wrong time. Yeah. But yeah, it does exist, mental illness, obviously. And but also there exists, and I do think it's important. It's misdiagnosing of people. Yeah. You know. Look, um, it. You know, it's not like when you open it up, there's jars of soup, and we're either yeah. tomato or you know chicken noodle. Yeah. So it's a whole potpourri yeah. of what's wrong. But it certainly isn't because you're acting wacky. Yeah. You or know. because you're just a or, crazy bitch or you know, a moody you woman. To or have a, a yeah. cut at age 15. Yeah. Or that you're just a moody woman. Oh, that is woman. nuts. You know, <laughs> when you're when you're a woman as well, people do a lot of this. Oh, you're just a moody woman stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're not supposed to stand up for yourself and all this. I wish I saw your gig on on Saturday. Uh, I, I have to come to